Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all wherever you are in the world and welcome to this RSC Sustainability Showcase. RSC Sustainability is a new journal. We published our first full edition in January of this year, so we've been going for not quite six months now. And we cover a broad range of the chemical sciences and chemical sciences contributions to sustainability. And today we're going to have um, some members of our RSC sustainability community to, who are going to talk to you about various different papers um, that we have published since we got started. The format will be some of these are pre recorded, and so we'll have a pre-recorded section, and then we'll have some uh, live people, and then back to pre-recording, and then back to live people, then finally back to pre-recording uh, pre um, again before it moves over to me to finish up the um, session. So really, I think that's all you need to know for now, and we can move on to our first pre-recorded segment. Uh, dear readers, this is Zheng Yusun. I would like to recommend you a paper of platinum tin as a superior catalyst for proton exchange membrane fuel cells, recently published in RSC Sustainability. Proton exchange membrane fuel cells generate electrical power in a wide range of applications from miniature devices to vehicles. In proton exchange membrane fuel cells, Platinum remains the preferred catalyst for both anode and cathode. However, due to the high cost and the limited availability of platinum, the amount of platinum used must be minimized, if not completely eliminated. To reduce the amount of platinum used in fuel cells, alloying of platinum with other elements provides an effective way this paper demonstrates the synthesis of platinum tin alloy catalyst with an average particle size of about 2 nanometer uniformly dispersed on bulky carbon through a very simple polio process with good electro-oxidation for molecular hydrogen at the anode and electro-reduction of oxygen at the cathode. The synthesized catalyst with a platinum tin mass ratio of three demonstrated superior electrocatalytic properties of four and 1.4 uh, performance fold over platinum supported on carbon reference catalyst for oxygen reduction reaction and hydrogen oxidation respectively. It also demonstrated a greater mass activity of 373 milliampere per milligram of platinum, that is 2.4 fold improvement compared to the platinum support on carbon reference catalyst. To prove the good activity of catalyst, it was conducted in self breathing fuel cell test and a maximum power density of 96 milliwatt per square centimeter was observed. That is 45% improvement compared to the platinum on carbon reference catalyst. The stability of the resulting platinum tin catalyst was further analyzed by performing an accelerated stress test within the self breathing fuel cells. The performance loss after 60,000 cycles was only 9% at a current density of 150 milliwatt milliampere per square centimeter and 85% of maximum power density retained. So these results are superior to earlier results in literature. This proved the capability of the result in platinum tin catalyst to be operated in self-breathing fuel cells. Overall, this is a very interesting work 
showing the potential of the prepared platinum tin alloy catalyst supporting bulky carbon to replace the existing platinum supporting a carbon catalyst for both anode and cathode in proton exchange membrane fuel cells. I would like to give my strong recommendation. Thanks. The title of the work is the Sustainable Materials for Renewable Energy Storage in the Thermal Battery. Um, so this is broadly um, what we are working in our group and focusing on, uh, and it's a thermal energy storage technologies um, that will enable us to store uh, large quantities of renewable energy. Uh, so this work presents uh, five um, dicarbamate materials uh, that are potential phase change materials, so materials that, that can store energy over a reversible phase transition. And they can store this energy in form of a thermal energy and then can be used in uh, directly store thermal energy or to store uh, electrical energy, electrical input uh, as a thermal energy and then be utilized uh, again to produce electricity. Mostly, um, if we are thinking about a sustainable society, uh, we want to progress more towards uh, renewable energy uh, that can be used in our everyday life. And a current challenge with renewable energy uh, sources is not uh, their availability, uh, however, their storage. So they are available, but they're intermittent. And uh, so in order to uh, allow us to use them uh, continuously, we need a, a cheap, reliable, and long-lasting energy storage solution. And uh, batteries, like lithium-ion batteries, they're great. However, they can't maintain all of the uh, energy storage um, we need in order to, to, have, um, to have the uh, renewable energy storage more available uh, for, uh, for all of us. Um, therefore, we are looking for other alternative energy uh, storage solutions, and thermal energy is one of them. So yeah, in terms of what are we tackling, we're tackling um, energy storage for, uh, for everyday use. Lithium ion batteries, uh, they are great. However, the, you know, they're used in many uh, you know, everyday devices, they're used in cars. Uh, their sustainability is not great, uh, so lithium is not very abundant. Uh, it's also coming from, uh, from places uh, that have uh, some issues. So um, we're looking to things that don't have those problems. So uh, phase change materials um, that we are working on, um, those diisocyanates, uh, they made from sustainable, sustainable sources. So um, those materials are synthesized in a basically one step reaction without any solvent uh, at temperature around 60 degrees we have a potentially sustainable and 70% of, of that material is already sustainable. Uh, the synthesis is sustainable. We're going without solvent at you know, 60 degrees, so not very elevated temperatures. And where uh, the, um, the reaction goes without any byproducts. So it's, um, we're uh, taking isocyanate, we're taking CR alcohol and all end up in the final product. And so having that material then um, being potentially in the future, even more sustainable than it's now, uh, we can use that in order to store renewable, um, renewable energy um, in a cheap way. Uh, we also study a thermal stability of those materials. So we're showing that um, they can be potentially used over um, many, many years, around 15 years. And then we're also showing how they can be recyc recycled. So if something happens with them, which we believe shouldn't, uh, but if there are any impurities that affect their thermal um, stability, then we can uh, purify them and um, you know, reuse them again. I would say that the highlights are um, those materials that have a suitable melting point for the Carnot battery that is between 100 and 200 degrees. Their melting point is around 120 and 130 degrees. Um, they have a high enthalpy of fusion that is basically the amount of heat, so the amount of energy in form of the heat the material can store. Uh, it's quite high, around 200 joules per gram. And then thermal stability. Um, that would I would say that are um, 
the three highlights in terms of material performance and then the sustainability aspect of those materials. We have uh, developed a, an innovative um, anode material for soil microbial fuel cell. Uh, the anode is, consists of um, a graphite felt functionalized with cobalt oxide and polyaniline. And it is a strategy to enhance the conductivity of the uh, electrode as well as the biocompatibility so to allow the development of an anodic biofilm uh, uh, onto the electric surface that actually will um, enhance the electrochemical performance of uh, the overall system. What we particularly in this study were interested to uh, determine how the properties of the electrode material, specifically the anode, uh, were useful or could be used to enhance the overall performance. And that's what we observed where incorporating like cobalt oxide and polyanilene enhance the overall performance compared to the conventional electrodes that are being used, which is uh, graphite felt. So in terms of energy, sustainable energy, so the benefits are cost effectiveness, a simplicity, um, uh, sustainability, because there are no precious metals or rare metals involved uh, or other type of materials involved. And uh, the fact that actually the maintenance requirements are, um, are really uh, low. And in terms of bioremediation, uh, it is uh, there are lots of advantages that are associated with biological treatments of pollutants, again, associated with the cost effectiveness of the overall process and the fact that um, it, uh, potentially the technology can speed up the rate of pollutant uh, removal compared to other biological treatments. Conventional graphite cells have been like there have been enormous large number of studies where they have shown the potential of the material for application in fuel cells not just the soil as well as the water-based systems where they are treating the contaminated wastewater or the contaminated soil with different kind of organic pollutants for this specific study uh, we were trying to understand that how uh, we can uh, like we can facilitate the performance of these graphite cells and there came the role of the metal oxides like for the electrodes Precious metals have always been the benchmark when it comes to controlling the uh, reaction rates at the electrodes. But our idea was to produce something which is very economical and feasible for us to for the commercialization of a technology at some stage. And uh, there we decided to uh, incorporate cobalt oxide and Cobalt oxide itself uh, is very conducting. Of course, every metal oxide adds on to the uh, conductivity of the material. But the idea was also to have a combination where not just the conductivity, but it is also uh, favorable for the biofilm formation, which is basically the, main, the first stage of microbial fuel cell enrichment from where we actually develop a gradient across the system. I honestly, I have had experience with polyanilene uh, during my PhD as well. But when uh, applying this uh, work on the soil microbial fuel cells, what quite interesting to this fact that uh, after the uh, study of like 30 and 60 days, we observed that the electrodes were still quite stable for uh, the application. The en biofilm enrichment was well maintained, unlike what I was expecting when I started the uh, study. Uh, because soil being a very complex matrix and the electrodes being deep into the uh, pressures uh, like embedded in the soil. But the entrapment of the electrode with the polymer and the uh, combination that we composed, we prepared. Uh, it, uh, it somehow uh, gave us a hint that maybe these composite materials that we developed have a more, uh, more applicability for a long-term application compared to the, uh, the con conventional start electrodes that often suffer from uh, like the surface degradation and surface area blocking. So that is some interesting observation from the study. 
cobalt oxide as this beautiful yeah. shape at the uh, at the nano scale. So we we call we refer to them as nano flowers. Uh, wow. So that they're beautiful. That they're really beautiful. And Simran last year was awarded the Image for Research Prize for a beautiful SEM images of her um, electrodes. <laughs> I don't know if it's <laughs> something you want to report, but but they are beautiful. And there's certainly no harm in your chemistry being beautiful, is there? And, and so we've just heard from some of our authors. In the next segment, we're going to hear from members of our editorial and advisory boards who are going to talk about um, some papers that have particularly piqued their interest. And we're going to start off with Fran Curtin. So over to you, Fran. Thanks, Tom. And also thank you to all our authors. It was really difficult to make a decision which paper I wanted to highlight and speak about for a short time now. So what I decided to talk about was a tutorial review um, that's on a zero waste biorefinery using ginger waste as a feedstock. So one of the things I found quite amazing is that, you know, we all know that ginger has been uh, cultivated for many, many years, but actually the market for ginger has grown quite a lot in recent times. So between 2017 and 2020, it increased by about 23%. So that means that while dried ginger is used a lot in baking in Europe, North America, around the world, there's a lot of um, waste that's being produced during that process that something useful could be done with. And so um, in terms of sustainable development goals, this research really addresses responsible consumption and production, but could also impact some of the other SDGs because normally waste might be disposed of at landfill or somewhere and produce methane and CO2 and that would impact climate change. And some of the potential applications for this waste are really interesting and could also um, impact energy and so on. And also because um, crops are produced in rural areas, this can lead to new good jobs and good employment opportunities in uh, rural regions. So I also work in biorefinery areas, but not anything about ginger. So this was brand new to me. Um, and I was surprised that uh, this waste until recently has really just been used in um, animal feed, even though as a spice, we would all know that it would have biologically active compounds in there, such as anti-inflammatory um, and so on. And so this review, I felt, did a really good job of highlighting different green extraction methods that people could apply to different waste streams. So that might be supercritical carbon dioxide extraction or microwave assisted extraction. And in addition to the bioactive components in this waste, they also highlighted some of the other materials that are present, such as starches and polysaccharides. And they can also be used to produce value added materials such as nanocelluloses. And um, in some cases, applications and transfer of that technology is going to be relatively easy and sometimes it's going to be more challenging. For example, um, essential oil or natural oil extracts um, are going to have antibacterial and antifungal properties and they could be used pretty readily and also use supercritical carbon dioxide that's already used on an industrial uh, scale. But other uses are relatively new and need further investigation and research. So the sugar or carbohydrate rich um, waste stream that has potential to undergo fermentation, particularly in the dark, to produce biohydrogen, which is considered a green and sustainable form of hydrogen. Also, um, the waste materials could be pyrolyzed and produce interesting porous carbons. And then these can be used in supercapacitors that are really important for energy storage. And so I encourage people watching this uh, live stream to read this paper out of the University of York and their collaborators. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fran. And now we're gonna move over to David Cole Hamilton. Yeah, no, I can hear you now. I, 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 I 
lost you. Can you hear me all right? Okay, so the paper, uh, welcome everybody and thank you very much for coming along. Uh, right. Uh, the paper I want to highlight is called Will the Circle Be Unbroken? The Climate Mitigation and Sustainable Development Given by a Circular Economy of Carbon, Nitrogen, Phosphorus and Water. It's by a group mainly from the University of Leeds in the Global Food and Environmental Institute, but assisted by people from Cambridge and the University of Illinois of Banner Champaign. This is about agriculture. And agriculture is one of the least circular things that we do. It's really a use and dispose type of uh, process. If you think about what happens, what happens is plants grow and they take nutrients out of the soil. Either we eat those plants and take the nutrients into us or animals eat them. And then maybe we eat the animals and the animals go into us. So all these nutrients in the soil are taken up and eventually end up in us. And most of it goes out simply flushed out of us in our sewage. And yet we don't put that sewage back on the land. Uh, the reason I'll come to in a moment. And so it's really a linear economy. And it, this paper is about, can we do something to mitigate that? And the reason it's not done, we don't put human sewage back on the land at the moment is really mainly because there are pathogens in it, which because of the temperature of processing are not destroyed and they can be dangerous to pub the public. There's also some level of public disgust at the concept. Uh, and uh, just as a, a slight aside, when I was young, my father did get hold of a batch of human sewage and he did put it on the land and it grew a fantastic crop of tomatoes because tomato seeds are not broken up by uh, the, what, the treatment of human sewage. So this paper looks at how, whether it's possible to recycle the nitrogen, phosphorus and carbon from the, ex, uh, from the excrement, from human sewage, to replace fossil-based nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers, both of which are very energy intensive in production and lead extensively to climate change. And if you want to see a bit more about that, I wrote a, um, an editorial for issue two about the problem of nitrogen and phosphorus. What these people found was that if you were to take the human sewage generation in a particular area and put it back on the land in that area, it could make a huge difference in some places to fertilize the demand and to productivity of the soil. So particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and Oceania, uh, then it makes a huge difference. In middle income countries, not so much. In Europe and uh, the United States, where there's a very strongly developed um, agricultural system, then it would make very little difference. Now, the, the reason is why is there that difference between these different parts of the world? And the main reason is that Europe and uh, the North America export a lot of their food. So a lot of the food that they're creating and the nutrients in that food are actually not excreted in North America. They agree to wherever they excrete, wherever they export it to. So one thing is export in, in, in sub-Saharan sub Africa, they import a lot of food. So they're producing more excrement than they would if they just use the food they grow in the country. And the other thing is, of course, in North America and Europe, there's a massive overuse of these fertilizers. There are incentives to make sure that you produce the maximum you can from the soil. And this leads to terrible problems of pollution with runoff and eutrophication. And so the, the recommendation here is that uh, legislation should be brought in. When the legislation allows the use of human-based fertilizers, then it should go hand in hand with reducing overuse because there's no point in trying to fertilize something which is already over, already over fertile. With carbon, that's mostly circular because the plants um, in photosynthesis take up carbon dioxide and we largely excrete it by carbon dioxide, but about 12% comes out in our excrement. And in agriculture, about 12% of carbon in the soil comes from fallow years or plowing in past crops. So there is a possibility there that we could do something. Uh, and the um, we, we could put about 12% of the carbon that we need into the soil by recycling human sewage. And of course, the, the main advantage of circularity then is to reduce the amount of fossil fuel based fertilizers that we use, ammonia and phosphates particularly, and that will reduce the carbon emissions associated with them. But there's also another advantage and that is um, it will remove the direct production of nitrous oxide 
and methane in open sewers in developing countries. If you start to treat the sewage and take it away, then you don't get this extra, and it's a very large amount that comes out that way. And so the authors conclude in their paper that they can, they think that through uh, reducing the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that needs to be produced, you could reduce carbon dioxide emissions from agriculture, well, by about 140 teragrams, that's 140 million tons a year in 2022. And it's about 12% of the total emissions from those uh, producing facilities. And in terms of uh, carbon, you could put in about 104 million tons of carbon, which is about 12% of the estimated annual soil sequestration potential. In terms of closing off open sewers, you would save more, you'd save 445 million tons of carbon dioxide a year and in 2022, and that would rise to 562 kilo, uh, million tons in 2050. So I think this is a fascinating study. I think it's a really important study. I think it's something we really have to do because we cannot go on taking nutrients out of the soil and flushing them away and then um, spending, producing masses of carbon dioxide, making fertilizer to replace them. So I think this is a perfect paper for RSC sustainability. It's very broad in its scope, and I would urge you very strongly to go and read it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, David. That was that was really fascinating. So we're now moving on to our second pre-recorded segment um, to hear again um, from uh, some authors. We recycling metallic aluminum into blue aluminates and apply it as pigments for painting walls. Basically is that. Recycling aluminum is very important because bauxite is the only source of aluminum on earth. So, and it's not um, um, no renewable source. So uh, we need to recycle aluminum. One kilo of uh, recycled aluminum saves 5.4 kilos of bauxite and reduces the production of the weight. So this is are the challenges, making um, a better recovery of aluminum. The um, principal way to recycling aluminum is melting them but that requires some energy and generate uh, waste. With this process we are doing, there's no waste. So I think it's better. First, we take the metallic aluminum, we use it to that article can seals, and we submit the, them to uh, acid digestion uh, to obtain aluminum ions in solution. After that, we um, correct the pH to obtain boemite. And with boemite, which is an um, aluminum oxide and hydroxide, we mix with coloring ions, and in this case, cobalt and nickel to make blue aluminates, stirring for 24 hours and calcinated at 1000 degrees. This is the process to obtain the blue aluminates. After obtaining the blue aluminates, we apply it in painting, white commercial painting, and painting plaster blocks to simulate walls. And after that, we expose these plaster blocks painted uh, to harsh environments, uh, acid and alkali, to evaluate the color stability of these pigments. The part I'm, I think is most exciting of this work is recycling aluminum because we are doing something important here. Something, you know, we changed the world. Andrew, um, thank you for your contribution to RSC Sustainability. 
Um, I was hoping to learn a little bit more about your research on uh, supported nickel catalysts for hydrogenolysis. And so I was wondering if you could describe your work in perhaps a minute, summarize it for the, um, the viewers. Sure. Um, so the core of the work was looking at the mechanocatalytic hydrogenolysis of a model lignin ether. Um, and so kind of the novel aspect of it is that mechanocatalytic aspect where we do it essentially in a ball mill. And so instead of relying on the thermal energy, we use mechanical energy. Um, and here we were able to demonstrate that sort of the underlying chemistry that you would need to basically depolymerize lignin via hydrogenolysis can be done in a ball mill without you know, high temperatures or without additional solvents. Um, and then beyond that, we kind of looked more at sort of the reaction network of the hydrogenolysis, as well as how the milling affects the supported nickel catalysts themselves, whether it's activating the nickel or how the support interacts with the different reagents. So you mentioned about how um, you could um, maybe use lower temperatures. Um, could you talk a bit more about how the research you've done uh, addresses sustainability ch challenges such as saving energy? Sure. So for a lot of uh, chemical processes, and particularly when we're trying to break down lignin, you, a lot of the traditional processes use high temperatures and a lot of organic solvents in order to make these reactions happen. Um, and so by doing it in sort of the ball mill with the mechanocatalytic approach, we can run it at wholly room temperature. So we don't need to add in additional heating um, and we don't need to put the solvents in there and add energy to the solvents to get them up to kind of those reaction conditions as well. And so that's sort of part of how we can save energy and make the process potentially more efficient. On the back end as well, because we're not dealing with solvents, it can similarly make the separations of the final products more facile. Um, and we can kind of treat that as a whole separate system. We're not constrained with having the reaction in a solvent and then separating it out of it. We can kind of use that as an additional degree of freedom. And hopefully that could, again, potentially make the system more efficient, you know, lower the use of auxiliary chemicals and just make this less energy overall. Wow, that's really cool. The fact that you can use so much uh, less solvents as well and uh, that feeds into the separation. Um, so um, where do you see this work potentially going next? Sure, um, I think more short term, it's sort of, you know, moving into some different types of catalysts to see how those interact differently with the compounds, as well as moving towards chemicals that more resemble um, what is lignin. And so in this system, we had a very simple one because we were kind of the first people to demonstrate it. Um, here, we want to go in the future more towards substrates that have functionality and try to better understand how those additional functional groups, hydroxide, methoxy groups, are going to interact with the catalyst in a similar way. And so that's sort of, I think, the short-term goal was mm -hmm. to better understand the system more similar to how lignin is behaving. Well, that's, that's really neat. I know um, sometimes um, it can be tricky to expand onto those lignin, larger lignin model compounds. Yes. Um, and so, um, it, you know, you described how in the short term um, this would move forward. Um, do you think this could be potentially translated into applications? So maybe tied in with uh, a pulp and paper mill or something like that. Could you speak to that? Sure. I mean, I think there's um, a few different ways in which this sort of chemistry and technology can eventually make it to the real world. Um, you know, tying into a pulp and paper mill, you can use this potentially as sort of a novel pulping method, I could imagine. Um, you know, mechanical pulping is something that happens in the real world today. And so if you could essentially add the catalyst during that process and help break down the lignin, um, that could make the pulping easier later on. Um, I could also imagine it being combined with other mechanochemical steps or chemistries um, in terms of a whole sort of cellulosic breakdown. So you can start with whole cellulose, add in what catalyst you need to break down lignin, add in what catalyst you need to break down the cellulose, and just convert that all into these sort of sugars and simple aromatic compounds. I think those are real potential pathways for the chemistry to make it to the real world. Oh, wow, that just sounds amazing. It looks like uh, mechanocatalysis has a lot of promise for the future. 
So um, just want to thank you for uh, joining us and telling us all about your exciting uh, research. Thank you. It's always something I like to do. Hi, uh, my name is Cristina Pozo Gonzalo, an associate professor at Deakin University, and I'm also an associate uh, editor in the new journal ARC Sustainability, where we are publishing uh, great research uh, towards sustainability. So today I'm going to talk about uh, this paper. Uh, it's from Nosan uh, Muse Group and is focusing on a strategy uh, to deal with uh, waste uh, textiles, as we know, is one of the uh, bigger residues. So they are using a very interesting approach. And uh, what I like about this paper is that they are not only focusing on recycling uh, waste, is that they are giving it another purpose. And in this case is that they are converting these textiles into piezoelectronic materials. So basically these are materials that when we apply a physical stimulus, it, it uh, generates a bit of electricity. It can be used in the sensing, it can be used for uh, to identify failures in uh, different um, uh, uh, systems, like for example in the case of batteries or infrastructure uh, and so on. So this is an interesting uh, approach to deal with all this uh, waste that we are generating uh, instead of landfilling or incinerating uh, textiles. And thank you again to our authors and, of course, to Christina, um, who is uh, one of our editorial board, but couldn't be with us um, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, because for her, it's the middle of the night. Um, and so now we're going back live and um, over to Mike Sutton. Thanks, Tom. Um, I just want to uh, uh, highlight a paper that I found really uh, fascinating, uh, interesting one, biologically uh, bound nickel accelerated depolymerization of polyethylene to high value hydrocarbons and hydrogen. And what's so great about it um, is that actually it's it's working on a real problem that's, that we all know about plastics, okay? It's pro plastics that are out there and it's working on plastics, it's polyethylene. So 36% of all the plastics that are out there and it's something where there's very little of the recycling at the minute. Where we do have that at the minute, the, the recycling that is there, um, it, the current process, it's not great on the economics, okay? It's a high temperature process, so over 700 degrees. Um, it has some catalyst coking issues, deactivation of that, and you need some hydrogen in it. So it's it's a real problem that's actually out there that needs, needs a solution. And so this team, uh, actually it's a, team from York, uh, both biology and chemistry. Another great thing about this is actually bridging those gaps between uh, between uh, not just a, a straight chemistry way of looking at it. They really went back and started thinking about it in an LCA kind of way. So some real LCA thinking, life cycle analysis thinking, and what they're able to do is, is to go away and think, well, okay, on the rationality of that work, how are we going to do this on that life cycle? We don't want to go away and, and, and have huge mining problems with more nickel, you know, need, need to go away and get, get that. <clears throat> because there's also some social issues about where, where there are within this. So again, other sides to sustainability coming within there. So what they ended up doing is they're ending up look, using uh, agro mining techniques. So being able to go away and use plants to take up the, the, the nickel that they wanted within that. And then they were gonna combine that with microwave, um, a microwave uh, assisted uh, technique to be able to go away and, and, and uh, bring forward a, a new cycling uh, technique. And so what they ended up doing is they, they, they fixed some nickel um, in, in some plants, dried them out, <coughs> a, a microwave uh, pyrolyzed them. And then they've followed that all the way through and then a range of conditions that they're able to get to. And some of the, the observations that came from all of this is that they're able to end up with a tunable process. Okay, It's a low temperature process. So 250 degrees C, 
very, very different than, than what they had before. So they don't end up, they're not seeing the, the same uh, issues in terms of uh, catalyst uh, coking. Um, they're also able to tune it. So they end up with a range of uh, lower molecular weight and mono aromatics, some hydrogen. So instead of needing hydrogen, they're actually able to produce hydrogen out of this uh, technique as well. And so what you're able to see when you see the whole rounding of this paper is, is that it brings all of those things together, comes up with something that ultimately you could potentially see this as a commercially viable route forwards and something that actually can make that impact out into society. So it's a great paper. I'd advise people to really get out and have a, a read of it. Uh, and overall, I, I really thoroughly enjoyed uh, reading it. Back to you, Tom. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Mike. And uh, moving swiftly to South Africa, Vincent. Uh, thank you, Tom, and uh, a good day to all the viewers. Um, the paper I'm going to highlight today is on upcycling of uh, textile waste into high added value cellulose polyurethane materials. That's your aerogels and chirogels. It's a paper from the University of uh, PC PCL. Uh, why did we look at this paper in particular? Why do you think it's suitable for RSE sustainability, sustainability journal? Uh, there are issues around what we produce, how we produce, and the waste generated thereafter. Uh, this research in particular highlights two issues, two pressing, two pressing issues that have been highlighted by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. That's on industry, innovation, and infrastructure. That's addressed on goal number nine. Also, this paper addresses goal number 12. That's responsible consumption and also production of what we try and make. So this particular research article in particular looks at textile, textile waste in, in, in this case. I've chosen this paper because it's interesting. It deals with real issues issues that we take in for granted, and they're becoming increasing of concern. As much as human population is growing, uh, this could be maybe due, due to better living conditions, uh, which is not a bad thing, but more and more textile is required, and that translates to more and more waste. Unfortunately, also, the trends within fashion, the quick turnovers, the quick change of various fashions, is not helping. Textile industry in particular, we look at about only 20% of materials that are produced go into recycling. In this case, we generate what you call less valid materials, things that are used, for example, for your mattress fillers, things like insulators for your tubings for either heating or cooling. Those are very low valued materials in such. But what happens to the other 80%? It's a big problem. The upscaling option has become something that we should be thinking about. Currently, there's a lot being done in terms of uh, spinning new fibers. That's where the people just re-dissolve the cellulose and try and make uh, fibers out of them again. In this paper, it's trying to demonstrate the feasibility of making high added value materials in this case, we're looking at making cellulose aerogels. In this paper, in particular, they wanted to look at how they could make nanostructured materials, materials that are lightweight, which is good, things that you can tune in terms of size and shape, materials that have got high internal porosity, large specific surface areas with good or additional functional groups on the surfaces, and also materials that are biologically derived, meaning they could also be biodegradable, which is a plus. In this case, they started out to look at uh, four materials. One was used as a reference material, that, uh, that was the, the microcrystalline material that they had. And they had three other materials that were cellular-based wastes uh, from fabrics. There was cotton, and then there was viscose and rayon, where the latter two were regenerated cellulose uh, uh, fabrics. They also dissolved or dissolution these materials using two ionic liquid. One was a midazolium based ionic liquid and the amidide based ionic liquid, where the latter, in this case, 
was found to be cheaper, which is good. Easy to synthesize compared to the midazolam. It was also easy to work with or easy to handle. And also it was easy to recycle. We need to think about processes. It was easy to recycle this ionic liquid. Last but not least, it was also uh, one that gave good uh, dissolution. They also introduced a DMSO in this paper, and I thought, why did they have to do this? Is this DMSO a good solvent? It was just used as a core solvent, but why DMSO? How green is DMSO? But when you read further, it's interesting to see that the DMSO significantly assisted in the dissolution. It brought down the energy consumption in this particular paper. So it, there is some plus when we introduce things that are not necessarily green, but they have got some plus in other sustainable processes. Ethanol was used to coagulate the materials to generate the color gels. And there are three main color gels uh, that were made. There was uh, zero gels, there's aerosols, and there was a color gel that was used by using solvents and the freeze dry approach to make the sample. But what was more noteworthy was that the materials that were made, three of them are the low to medium degree of polymerization, what they call in the, this paper DP of the cellulose. That's why it's your MCC, it's the material that they used as a reference. And then there was the rayon and the viscose. However, when they look at the cotton that uh, was used in this case, the collagent material, the collagen method rather, uh, had no influence on the morphology of the low to medium degree of polymerized materials. Cotton, which has a higher um, DP, uh, that's your degree of polymerization, was very sensitive to the materials used, the method used. It was also sensitive to the solvent, your ionic liquid. So what does it tell us? In this paper, it tells us that the type of solvent that was being used, you could manipulate the final product. That's in terms of the morphology and the physical properties, such as your, your, your strength of the materials and shapes, the size, and also the porosity of these materials. The, also the method, the approach, there, there are two ways where they are to use liquids uh, either liquid liquid demixing such that it's either in instantaneous or delayed gave out two different materials so in other words the, the approach in some cases you could tune uh, the material or the output of what you wanted to generate as your aerosols or chirogels so in short uh, what was interesting uh, to see is that we we're able to see that this textile uh, industry with the lot being thrown away, the 80%, we can actually now look at how can we not just use the 20% to recycle, but to upcycle, to make materials that is worthwhile. Uh, in this paper, that's one thing I really liked about, one thing that I found to be very interesting, where we don't just make low valued materials, but we can actually make high valued materials. And in this case, the materials that were generated had very high porous uh, uh, nature. They were, they were very light, they were ultra light in this case, and they had very high or large specific surface area. And not only that, it's a bio-derived material, meaning it's biodegradable. And these sort of materials are highly sort of, uh, depending on your application. So I'll encourage, uh, readers uh, to go and look at this particular paper and read. I find it quite relevant and not only to sustainability of this uh, textile industry, but also very interesting to see how we could move from just recycling to upcycling of our materials. Uh, back to you, uh, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. Yes, and I agree with you completely. The the need for us to be able to upcycle rather than just recycle is absolutely vital if we're going to achieve a circular economy. So 
We now move on to our third and final of our pre-recorded segments. And again, back to some authors. In this paper, we, uh, we try to synthesize polymers which, uh, that contains acrylane units. And the reason why we turned our attention to acrylane is the incorporation of aldehyde units in polymers. And once we have aldehydes, we can, do, we can make many chemistries, including multi-component reactions. However, of course, the acrylane is very nice monomer, but its use is somehow tricky because the uh, boiling point or vapor pressure of the monomer is very high and the toxicity is also very high. So that was the challenging task in polymer science. So in this work, we uh, wanted to uh, showcase more sustainable synthetic method that allows us to install acrylane units into polymers uh, without the di direct use of acrylane monomers. I started with uh, the multi component reaction while I was in master degree. So these papers work helped me to know more about the reactivity and the possibility that use the LT high units into the passing reaction, no matter to make the normal material or in a new cell in the polymer chemistry. Our synthetic strategy is based on the uh, more stable polymers as starting polymers. So for, for this purpose, we choose uh, polyacrylates, very stable polymers and even very commercial polymers. And we turned our attention to partial reduction of ester units in polyacrylates. Then we can uh, convert polyacrylates acrylates units into acrylate units by partial, by a partial reduction of esters. So also in the final section about this work, we already successfully that used the LD high group to combine a plastic reaction that we can use the uh, cinnamate acid, which one is difficult to use in the post polymerization modification. But in this, our case, we can uh, introduce the cinnamate acid without a protect or deprotect procedure in the one part reaction. Our sustainable point is not only the production of polymers uh, featuring acrylate units, but also we can we are targeting polymers or functional polymers by using bio-based compounds. And in this paper, we pre, we synthesize and we design uh, photoresponsive polymers by using uh, passive reaction with cinnamate. Uh, so which is which should be a very nice topic for sustainable chemists and material scientists. We expect uh, this chemistry should be a good option in material science, especially because we can install many functionalities by using, for example, just for example, UGI reaction, passerine reactions, multi-component reaction to integrate uh, highly functionalized molecules. So I, I hope material science will turn our attention, uh, turn their attention to our work. In this work, our team designed a homogeneous soft wearable devices um, that is made of polyvinyl alcohol, which is known as a type of alcohol-friendly polymer. Um, then we combine it with the ionic liquid to improve the flexibility and stretchability. Um, the resulting polymer film can still be 100% recyclable, allowing for the material to be easily reused. And the film is endowed by ionic liquid to be ionic conductivity, uh, to be ionic conductive and show responsive behaviors towards the elongation, humidity, and temperature. 
um, making it an ideal material for fabricating multifunctional sensors. And that's all we done in that paper. During the uh, review part, uh, we found the sustainability challenges in the field of wearable technology, um, which is a rapid growing industry that has been facing the issue of uh, non-recyclable materials leading to environmental pollution, and which uh, is also the traditional electronic devices, what, face, uh, what they faced. And the use of traditional materials in wearable devices has um, resulted in a large amount of waste that cannot be reused or recycled, which poses a significant threat to our uh, Earth's environment. This works aims to tackle this challenge by providing a variable material uh, that is both eco-friendly and sustainable for the green manufacturing and development of wearable technology. The ionic liquid can, well, one way is, uh, first is enhance the mechanical properties of the polyvinyl alcohol film um, to, uh, to let the film to be stretchable and flexible while the whole film is still maintain the homogeneous space property. And what's more is the film show excellent sensing ability, stability on the different working conditions like we showed in paper uh change the, the te if the temp temperature or the humidity change we can still have a good sensing performance towards elongation or vice versa and the introduce of ionic liquid can not only enhance the mechanical property behavior along with the uh, conductivity but also the whole material is 100 percent recyclable during not only the production, but also the application part. So that's what we try to uh, improve in this uh, paper and work. One more thing is, um, so we use one kind of ionic liquid in our paper, uh, along with the polyvinyl alcohol. Uh, what I want to say is, um, well, the polymer is not restricted to be PVA because, well, there's various green, uh, environmentally friendly polymer which can be easily recycled and reused like uh, calcium and uh, gelatin. And also the ionic liquid is highly designable to uh, reach our goal, which is to say um, if we have different functions in this part, we can use different ionic liquid, uh, such as the T TFSI based one. So there's a lot of papers have already reported to use that polymer to um, kind of assemble some uh, high capacity energy storage devices. So an ideally um, plan is we can use this Feel not only as a sensing part, but also we integrate it with the energy storage to build a all-in-one devices. So, well, that's a kind of challenge and uh, what we want to do in the uh, next part. Photocatalytic water splitting is an efficient and greener way towards the hydrogen evolution, but it is basically hindered by the oxygen evolution, which is the second part. Here, oxygen evolution requires the four electron process, and because of that, the kinetics uh, it's basically the hindered and hydrogen production also get hampered. So utilizing a sacrificial reagent and especially the biomass components is an efficient and prudent way towards the higher hydrogen production but can we simultaneously utilize the biomass component towards the value-added products in answering this question and utilizing the electrons and holes simultaneously we have made a successful attempt here we have utilized AUTIO to composite in which the AU is present as an 
anionic form which tells there is an electronic interaction between the TiO2 and AU and here we are able to produce hydrogen as well as the VAPS value added products in value added products which is formic acid glycoaldehyde as well as the dihydroxyl acetone this uh, study also focus on the three challenges of the sustainability which is given by the UN the, th the seventh one the clean and affordable energy the twelfth one is a responsible consumption and production and the thirteenth one is a climate action the highlight of this study is that the gold is deposited over the TiO2 in very small clusters by the facile photo deposition which is a very simple process the photo deposition method and we are able to control the size of the gold and we restrict it to the less than one nanometer and in results we are getting the very high photocatalytic activity this results this study also extended from the glycerol to the cellulose and as well as the glucose also and here we found that the glucose and cellulose are also giving the hydrogen evolution uh, and uh, which tells its application towards the wide variety of the biomass component <coughs> and then uh, this study can also be extended towards the other co-catalyst metals like single metal as well as biometals uh, and the biometal by tuning their composition we can go to the toward the selective value added products like suppose glycerol is there we are forming the formic acid glycoaldehyde dihydroxyacetone we can restrict to the one uh, byproduct so this study gives the light towards that one also as well as the higher higher hydrogen production <laughs>
And looking across all 17 of those, I think that within these first few months, we've almost, but perhaps not quite, but almost got to all 17. So that's a remarkable achievement. But some common themes are starting to emerge. And so I'm recognising that we're getting an awful lot of materials, um, materials for energy, materials for construction, materials of all sorts of different types. And we're seeing a great focus on the circular economy. We're seeing an awful lot of papers that are coming to tell us how we are going to enable the, the sustainable economy, and particularly that last one that Vincent um, talked about, and the idea of upcycling rather than just recycling. And so, as I say, this incredible breadth, but starting to see some kind of focus emerging. If you are thinking, perhaps I might submit my paper to RSC Sustainability, I bring you back to that purpose of ours. It is to report advances in the chemical sciences in the broadest possible definition of those that contribute to the advancement of one or more of the sustainable development goals. And it is not for us to act as judges or gatekeepers. It is for you to explain to us, and of course, therefore, to the broader readership of the journal, how your work does that. That is the thing that gets you into the scope for the journal. So if you think you can do that, I would really strongly encourage you to submit your papers to the journal. And really now that's just coming to the end. As I say, I, I also need to thank everybody on the editorial team who have worked so hard to make the journal launch a success. And thank you for coming to listen to us today. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and good night to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.